Won't you turn with me in your Bibles to the passage that is before us this afternoon in 1 Peter chapter 1. Some of us have just uh, been up to Shepherds uh, this week, as Gavin had mentioned, and I would really encourage anybody who can make it next year uh, to go. It uh, really was an incredible blessing um, to sit under some incredible and to have wonderful fellowship and to hear about 130 men singing uh, at the top of their voices. Hmm. Too good. Too good. I'm going to read for us uh, verses 1 to 12 of uh, 1 Peter 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, Though now for a while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what personal time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. We're continuing in the series in 1 Peter, which we started last year. And let us remind ourselves what we have learned so far. I've basically read it out here, but Peter is writing to the Christians scattered around Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. They were scattered because of the persecution, and he's reminding them that they are sojourners, strangers in this world. And don't forget that what Peter writes to these uh, Christians, he writes to us also. In verses 1 to 5, we looked at our glorious salvation. We saw how we were divinely chosen, how we were mercifully saved, with God causing us to be born again into a living hope. We got a glimpse of our heavenly inheritance that is being kept for us and how we are being powerfully protected by God until that day. A glorious salvation for which we should and must give God all the praise and all the glory. In verses 6 to 9, we looked at the trials and triumphs of our faith. And Peter reminded us to rejoice in our salvation, even though it was necessary to go through trials, present trials, because these trials test the genuineness of our faith and we'll be rewarded in heaven. And all this is possible because of Jesus Christ, because it is through him that we are obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls, trials that allow us to triumph with a belief in and a love for Jesus. True saving faith results in our salvation with joy inexpressible. This passage, these 12 verses that we've read, 
is like reading one lengthy doxology, an expression of praise to God. And Peter is expressing this praise to God in the context of our salvation. He is encouraging persecuted saints and is laying the foundation for what is to come, what we'll get to. And that foundation is their standing in Christ, their salvation. And it is almost as if on each occasion Peter deals with the salvation, he has something new to say about it, and it causes great rejoicing and praise. And so we now come to the passage this afternoon in our study in verses 10 to 12. And Peter writes, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Peter says concerning this salvation. Which salvation? We just go back to verse 9 where he says the salvation of your souls. And as I've said, Peter has expressed much praise and rejoicing in the salvation and he's about to give us further reasons to marvel in the salvation. So far, Peter has shown us the wonder of our salvation from the viewpoint of being recipients of it. And it is very interesting, the change of approach that he takes in this final little section. And he does so by looking back and showing us the agents used to elevate the richness of our redemption in salvation. They are the prophets, the Holy Spirit, the apostles, and the angels. Peter wants us to fully comprehend how precious the salvation was to his hearers and how rich our redemption is for us. And he does this by magnifying God's amazing grace as shown in these agents. And as we study these verses, today we'll see three ways God's amazing grace is magnified for true believers. Firstly, we see God's amazing grace magnified through inquiring prophets. Through inquiring prophets. Verses 10 and 11. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what personal time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glories. Let me at the outset just make some observations about the prophets. The first observation is that by very nature of the text suggests that these are Old Testament prophets. The second observation is based on our translations. We will see it says the prophets. Whereas in the original, it literally just says prophets. There is no defi definite article. So who were these prophets? Well, I believe it's safe to say that it was all the prophets from Moses to Malachi. Brethren, there are so many prophecies concerning the Messiah. Uh, Gavin prayed about that as well, of his coming. Starting right in the beginning of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14, approximately 4,000 years ago. There is a, uh, sorry, 4,000 BC. There is a promise that the Messiah was from, or of the Messiah from God himself. Around 2,000 years later in chapter 12 of Genesis, there's the prophecy that the Messiah would be of Abraham's offspring. In Genesis chapters 21 and 35, it's prophesied the Messiah would be descended from Isaac and Jacob, respectively. And approximately 1,300 years later, in Micah chapter 5, the prophecy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And Isaiah chapter 7, that he would be born of a virgin. 
I could go on and on. But most importantly, each one of these prophecies have been fulfilled in the New Testament. But these are not the prophecies that Peter is referring to in these verses. If you look at verse 10, Peter says that the prophets prophesied about the grace. It's a saving grace. The salvation that was to be yours. Peter is telling these readers here that the prophets of old eagerly anticipated this great salvation and that they, the scattered saints, which they were experiencing. And I can almost hear your minds ticking over because you want to ask, but weren't the prophets saved as well? Well, yes, they were. Were they not recipients of God's grace? Yes, they were. But they received the gift of salvation without ever seeing or understanding the Messiah's accomplishment of the salvation. His death and resurrection. Without ever knowing Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, that great chapter on the heroes of the faith. Look at verse 13. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And again in verses 39 and 40. And all these, the same heroes of the faith who have gone before, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. As most commentators agree and point out, these did not receive the fulfillment of the promise yet. And verse 40 spells it out very well. It says the fullness of salvation is our experience and through that these saints of old are made perfect. Isn't that mind-boggling? Doesn't that make your heart leap? And no wonder Peter rejoices much and prays God for our salvation that he speaks of so eloquently in this opening salvo in 1 Peter. There was a further mystery to the salvation that they prophesied. They knew it was future. They prophesied of the grace that was to come. This grace encompasses, it embodies, it includes salvation, but it is greater than that. When we consider the Old Testament uh, and the God's dealings with Israel, we probably only ever think of the law and law-keeping. We never think of God's grace being present in those times. But God, by His very nature, is gracious. God is gracious in our day and age, and He was just as gracious in the Old Testament times. Because that is who God is. Listen to what He says in Exodus 34 and verse 6 as He passed by Moses. He says, The Lord, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious. Jonah ran from the task that he, had, that he was given because he did not want God to save the Ninevites. And in Jonah 4 verse 2, we read, That is why I made haste to flee Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful. Another clue that we have that this grace was still to come is found in verse 12 of 1 Peter where it says what does it say there? It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. Peter makes this personal. These prophets who were serving the scattered saints in Asia Minor and serving the saints in every age 
But not only was the mystery for the future, but the prophets also knew that this salvation would extend to all nations. In Isaiah 45 and verse 22, God says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. God is declaring that he will call the nations to salvation. And again in Isaiah 55 verse 5, Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. Let us for a moment just look at some of the fulfillments of these. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Look at verses 24 and 25. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, Those who are not my people I will call my people, and her who was not beloved I will call beloved. And Paul quotes from Hosea chapters one Verse, chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 and from chapter 2 verse 23 look at chapter 10 and verse 20 then Isaiah is so bold to say I have been found by those who did not seek me I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me and Paul is quoting from Isaiah 65 verses 1 and 2 so these prophets understood that the oracles, the very words God had given them, was for future generations and that God's amazing grace would extend beyond Israel. It is no wonder then that we read in verse 10 that these prophets searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was prophesying these things or predicting these things. They searched and inquired carefully. Notice the nature of the inquiry. They inquired carefully. The King James says they searched and inquired diligently. And if you have the NIV, you will read that they searched intently and with great care. I actually like the NIV in that one. It just spells it out so nicely do you get the intensity do you get the the care they took to search the scriptures and it is interesting to note here that the verb it is singular there is only one word used to express this and it is found only once here in 1 Peter Notice to the focus of their inquiry. They were inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was doing these things. What person or time. Some translations say what person or season or circumstances. They wanted to know about this Messiah. They wanted to know when this was going to happen. And what were the circumstances? What were they going to be? And this salvation was of such extreme interest to these prophets that it triggered an intense searching into their own writings and that of other prophets' writings. We know the prophets searched others. Daniel tells us that he found that the uh, exile was going to be 70 years by reading Jeremiah. But why did they do this? Well, of all the truths they had received, through the revelations from God, this subject of salvation was what motivated, was what drove them to this inquiry, to understand it. They prophesied of this grace, the salvation to come. There is no greater subject in this world, in the whole universe, that is so important as salvation. They wanted to know more. There is no doubt they knew that they were prophesying about a future Messiah. 
They knew facts about the Messiah in their prophecies. Look at verse 11, where it says that they were inquiring on personal time. The Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. They knew the Messiah would suffer. They knew the Messiah would triumph. They knew the Messiah would save. We've seen that. And they wanted to know about the time when this was going to be and the circumstances of his coming. And the key to this is the second agent through which Peter is indicating that the salvation has come to us. Peter tells us in verse 11 that it was the Spirit of Christ in them, that is the prophets, that, he, that was indicating when he, that is Christ, predicted his, that is Christ's, sufferings and subsequent glories. Or well, some translations say the glories to follow. There were two distinct facts here that the prophets knew about the Messiah. That he would suffer and that he would triumph. He would have glories that would come. And isn't it fascinating that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ in this verse? In Romans 8 verse 9 we read, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And here we see the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, used interchangeably. The subject of salvation was the driving, consuming curiosity of the prophets. And it was the Holy Spirit who was the driving force of the revelation of the salvation throughout Scripture. Peter is giving us insight here that the revelation, that all revelation is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. He writes himself in the next letter in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Remember, this is the verse that is key in our studies that we've been having in our Bible hour. All Scripture is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. These prophets had the Spirit of Christ in them predicting His sufferings. You can go and read Psalm 22 where the prophet David writes about the sufferings of Christ. Daniel 9.24 speaks of putting an end to the sin and atonement for iniquity. Zechariah 12.10, when they look upon him whom they have pierced. And the most well known is Isaiah 52.13 to 53.12. Can you imagine Isaiah prophesying about the Messiah who would be despised and rejected? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That he would bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. That the Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. That his punishment would bring us peace and that we would be healed, spiritually that is, through his wounds. And we can look back now, know that central to these sufferings of Christ and our salvation is Christ and the cross. Central. Could you just imagine Isaiah pinning this down, scratching his head, and saying, what does this mean? Who is this Messiah? What will he look like? Where will he come from? When is this going to happen? No wonder they wanted to know more. No wonder they searched so intently to know who this person was and the time and circumstances. 
But listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 17. He says, For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The Jews of Jesus' day did not get it. They had the scriptures. They had the writings of the same prophets, just as we have today. They did not get it. There are still Jews today who ask, who is the Messiah? And they still look for him in the scriptures. And still they can't find him. They don't get it. And not only does prophecy bear witness to Jesus, but Jesus bears witness to prophecy. Remember when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples? We read in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Two weeks ago, Andrew preached in Acts chapter 10. And when Peter was preaching to Cornelius, in verse 43, he said of chapter 10, To him, that is Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Not only did the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, reveal the sufferings of Christ to these prophets, he also revealed the glories of Christ to follow. David, in that great Messianic Psalm 116, verse 10, says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. And referring to Christ's resurrection, Peter quotes this in his sermon in Acts chapter 2. Paul does the same in Acts 13, 33 to 37, where he says, Therefore, he says also in another psalm, You will not let your Holy One see corruption. And then he explains it. He says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Psalm 68 verse 18 speaks of the ascension of Christ. You ascended on high. Paul speaks to the psalm in, Ephes in Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 10 when he speaks of Christ's ascension. Psalm 16 verse 8 and Psalm 110 1 speaks of Jesus' exalt exaltation at the right hand of God the Father. What about Christ's future kingdom glories? Where do we start? <laughs> Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, I think, is probably one that I will just use. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. As you can see, it's so easy for us to refer to scriptures to try and prove or convince someone of the truths of scripture. But you'll notice that Peter does not do that in this passage. He does not go to individual prophets. Instead, he is pointing us to the richness of our redemption by showing us the passionate, driving compulsion of the prophets to understand their own and other prophecies about the Messiah and the redemption that was to come. How rich is our redemption? Beloved, should we who are on this side of redemption story not be as zealous as the prophets were to search the scriptures, to know the Savior, Jesus Christ, better, the one who has suffered 
and borne the very punishment for our sin to save us from eternal damnation that we should know him better more intimately the one who has been exalted to the right hand of God and who now intercedes for us transgressors as Isaiah 53 12 tells us he intercedes for us even now should we not search intently and with great care what it is he desires of us for we are his we have been bought with a great price the blood of Christ so how did this grace come to the scattered saints in Asia Minor well, verse 12 says that in the things that was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven and here we see God's amazing grace is magnified through gospel preaching or preachers God's amazing grace is magnified through gospel preachers it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in their search for understanding what the Holy Spirit had revealed to them these pro these prophets came to understand that it was not for them it was not for the people of their time but for generations to come and Peter says it is to you the scattered church in Asia Minor to whom he is writing and of course to you here at Living Hope Baptist Church in Peter Maritzburg to whom he has written and Peter continues and says in the things through who sorry in the things through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven in the things what is this that Peter's been writing about? The things which the prophets foretold, the sufferings and glories to follow, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and which Peter says are the same things that have now been preached to you, and which Peter calls the good news, the gospel of salvation. We again see that the work of the Holy Spirit continues to be employed in this gospel preaching. It is through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Peter does not specify from whom the scattered saints may have received, may have received the gospel message. For some it may have been Peter himself, we do not know. We know that this good news, the gospel by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, was first preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. And in Acts 2 verse 42 we read and they that is the early church devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers and in Acts 4 verse 33 we read and with great power the apostles plural were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all and so we see the third agent used in bringing salvation to us the Apostles Paul writing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 2 verses 19 and 20 says so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but your fellow citizens with the Saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the Apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus is the cornerstone God's amazing grace is magnified through gospel preaching it is the means God uses to bring the lost into his kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit and central to gospel preaching is Christ and the cross Christ and the cross Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 1 18 for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God 
And in verse 21 and 23, For since the wisdom of God, the world, for in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. The cross of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. The gospel proclamation first started by the apostles. It continues to this day 2,000 years later and it must continue until the Lord returns. In Romans 10 verses 13 to 15, sorry I'll give you so many scriptures, but Paul tells us, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. What motivation this is for evangelism. What motivation this is for missions. May I ask you this afternoon, do you remember when you first heard the gospel? When the veil was lifted and you finally understood your need for a saviour? Do you remember the day that it was explained to you that you were on the wide road to hell because of your sin? That God hates sin and he must punish sin? That he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to this earth to take the punishment for your sin and to die on that cross on Calvary? That you needed to confess your sin, repent of your sin, to flee from your wickedness and to flee to Christ? Do you remember that day? Do you remember who it was that you heard this from? Was it a preacher? Was it a friend? Oh, dear friends, give thanks to God for that preacher. Give thanks to God for that friend. Beloved, this proclamation of the good news of salvation is entrusted to every single true believer. It's entrusted to you if you truly know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Is entrusted to me. Please don't waste the opportunities we have. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, says Paul. First to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Romans 1.16 There is one final nugget in this passage before us this afternoon in verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. I scratched my head when I came to this part of it. But it's so wonderful. And so thirdly we see God's amazing grace is magnified through curious angels. And this last section repeats the word things, the things into which angels long to look. These are the same things referred to earlier, the gospel truths of Christ's sufferings for the salvation of sinners like you and me. And these concluding comments here in verse 12 brings our focus into the heavenly realm. The angels are created beings who do, do God's bidding. Just go and put a search in for the angel of the Lord and see how many times it comes up in the Old Testament. Just the angel of the Lord. But the angels were in attendance at Jesus' birth. 
They attended to him when he was tempted in the desert. They strengthened him when he was in anguish in the garden of Gethsemane. They were at the resurrection. They caught, there was an earthquake and the angels were sitting on the stone when it rolled away. They were there at his ascension. Remember too that there were angels who had rebelled. And in fact Peter tells us in Second Peter that God did not spare them. They were cast into hell. And so think about it. These angels know there's no redemption for fallen angels. And yet, God provides salvation for fallen man. Man who has rebelled and sinned against God. And Peter tells us that the angels long to look into this. And the word long here denotes an intense interest. And the word look is like bending over or peering in. Have you ever bought an item that needs assembling and it was made in China? And you're trying to read the instructions which don't make sense? But there are diagrams. And you are huddled over the instructions trying to figure them out. This is kind of the picture I got from this. It's the same thing that the angels are doing. They're bending over, they're peering into, trying to figure this out. As one commentator put it, those great and glorious realities concerning the Messiah that fascinated the prophets and engaged the energies of the messengers of the gospel are also the objects of intense angelic interest. The angels, dear friends, have no experience of redemption. And nor do they have need of it. And that is why this is so intriguing that they have an insatiable desire to understand this redemption. And they want to understand it more to give God glory because that's why they exist. The angels exist in the heavenly realms to give God glory and to worship Him. And Jesus tells us in Luke 15 verses 7 and 10 that there is joy in heaven. There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. They rejoice in it, but they don't understand it. They long to know more about it. Our dear friends, Peter has given us a glimpse here of how special our salvation is, how rich our redemption is. By magnifying the intense desire the angels have to know more about our redemption and our salvation. He has shown us the richness of our redemption by magnifying the means by which we are saved. Through holy inspired gospel preaching. And he has shown us the richness of our redemption by pointing us to the Holy Spirit inspired prophets whose writings invoked an intense, diligent, careful inquiry to know what we now know and have experienced, the salvation of our souls. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your inspired word. We thank you, Lord, for showing us here through Peter the Apostle how rich our redemption is, how special, how precious our salvation is, that the prophets who prophesied of what was to come searched diligently. Oh, Lord, help us in our own 
private lives to be searching diligently the scriptures to know more. Lord, we may think we know everything about us and about our salvation and what has come. And we have so much to know that the prophets did not have. But yet, Lord, we will never stop learning until the day we die. And so, Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Make us diligent. Make us want to inquire intensely and with great care what you have given us in your word. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for those who have brought us this gospel by the Holy Spirit sent from you in heaven, that it has been preached to us, that it has been shared with us by friends or colleagues, whoever it was. Thank you for those dear people. Father, I thank you for that Germany in Southwest Africa 40 years ago that shared the gospel with me. Thank you. And Father, thank you for showing us how rich our redemption is. The fact that the angels who are with you, who do your bidding, who long to understand what we have and know in our salvation. Father, may we leave this place longing to share what you have given us with those around us. There's a lost world. Lord, we thank you again for your word. And we give you thanks and praise and glory through that matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.